Hello, I'm Natalia Porqueres. I'm a postdoc at Imperial College and I will soon be moving to Oxford as a Vitro Fellow. And I will talk to you today about a field level approach to analyze with lensing that allows us to extract more information from the data and get more precise constraints on the cosmological parameters. So as you know, the weak lensing data consists of millions of images of galaxies and we don't see these galaxies as they really are. We see them slightly distorted because they are weakly gravitationally lensed by the large scale structures. Now, the standard approach to analyze all these galaxy images is to compress them, summarize them into a set of summary statistics and very often only the two point summary statistics like the correlation function and the power spectrum. Looking at the two point statistics of these data sets have brought us a long way and gave us a lot of insights into how the universe works and what it is made of. But now we need to start asking the question of doing this compressing all these galaxy shapes into just power spectrum and uh, correlation function, are we capturing all the information that is there in the data? And the answer is no. The standard approach misses a lot of information. As an illustration here, you see two fields that are clearly different by eye, but they have exactly the same power spectrum. So if we only measure the two point statistics of these fields, we would not be able to distinguish between a simulation of the cosmic web and a Gaussian random field. So this shows us that there is much more information in the data that what the two point statistics can capture. And if we want to make full use of the observations, we need to access this additional information. Now, one way to do that is to use high order statistics. So in this case, we would keep compressing the data into a set of summaries, but adding higher order correlation function. So um, this, is, this would allow us to extract more information, but this is usually very, very challenging to do. We don't know what the sampling distributions of these quantities are. And even if we assume a Gaussian likelihood, then the question is what is the covariance matrix and how can we compute that accurately? This is also somehow problematic because we never know when to stop. We can always come up with new uh, high order statistics and uh, we don't know at what point we have exhausted all the information that is there in the data. But luckily we have an alternative that is much more simpler from the point of view of physics and uh, it allows us to access all the information that is in the data. And that is to use a field based approach. So the idea in a field based approach is to analyze the data directly at the level of the pixelized shear without compressing them into a set of summaries. The way we can do that is that given some cosmology, we can build some predicted shear field and then we can compare this predicted shear field to the data at the field level. By doing this, doing all the statistics pixel by pixel, we can in principle access all the information that is in the data and we can make full use of the observations. Now to do this, to generate these predicted shear fields, we need simulations, we need a forward model. And here we are dealing with a probabilistic forward model because everything is set up in a way that the simulations are constrained by the data. So instead of using a set of simulations to train the machine as one would do in a machine learning approach, here we only explore the dark matter distributions that can plausibly lead to the structures we see in the data. So at the end of the day, we are going to get a reconstruction of the dark matter distribution that is there in the universe. To do that, we use the Borg framework because Borg has a gravity model and this is essential if we want to capture the nonlinearity and non-Gaussianity of the large scale structures. So this is how Borg for lensing looks like. So we start sampling the cosmological parameters using a uniform prior. And then we built a box of initial conditions. And since we know that the initial conditions are Gaussian, we use a Gaussian prior. We then evolve these initial conditions in time using the gravity model that also accounts for light cone effects. And this gives us the evolved dark matter distribution. Once we have this density field, we can integrate along the line of sight and apply the lensing model to uh, get the shear fields. So here we use a ray tracer to uh, and integrate along the line of sight. So we generate some cone of observations and then we obtain the convergence field and from here the shear fields. That means we have access to both the convergence and the shear and we can directly work at the level of the reduced shear that is what we actually observe. So this is also one of the advantages of this kind of methods that uh, we can directly work with the observables. <laughs> 
The last step we need to take here is to add survey effects, like for example, account for unobserved regions and uh, bright stars that block the light from distant galaxies. But this is very easy to do with a field-based approach. If you have a mask pixel, you give this pixel an infinite variance. So it's really easy. Now with this forward model, the sensitivity to the cosmology is threefold. It depends on the cosmology through the initial Matatawa spectrum that is encoded in the, uh, that determines the initial conditions, through the growth of structure that is encoded in the gravity model, and through the geometry, because every time we change the cosmology, the line of sight integral also changes and that affects the shear fields and the redshift of the box. So all these quantities here are updated consistently throughout the forward model. So every time we change and vary the cosmological parameters, we update them in the entire framework and we always have a consistent cosmology. And that's the first time we do this with the work framework. So with all this process, we have generated now some predicted shear fields that we can compare to the data using the likelihood. So here we have a likelihood at the pixel level uh, so we have uh, this likelihood runs over the different tomographic bins and the different pixels on the sky. And here we have the data and the model prediction that comes from evaluating the entire forward model. So to write down this likelihood here, we are assuming that the noise in the pixelized shear is Gaussian. So we assume that after we average the ellipticity of all the galaxies in the same pixel, the noise in these big pixels will be Gaussian distributed. One advantage that we have here also is that we don't need a covariance matrix. So we can assume here that the noise uh, in the different pixels is uh, independent. Uh, it's basically given by the number of galaxies that we have in that pixel. So this is basically Poisson noise. And we can assume that the noise is independent from pixel to pixel. Now, in reality, there, would be so, there will be some correlations that come from the intrinsic alignments, but we are uh, going to model these as part of the forward model rather than taking uh, the intrinsic alignments as a noise contribution. So we have the forward model, and what we want to do is to sample cosmological parameters and initial conditions simultaneously. That means that as Bayesians, what we want is the posterior distribution that tells us what's the probability of the cosmological parameters and the initial con conditions given some data. Now, uh, using the Bayes theorem, we can split this posterior distribution into four terms. The first term here is the probability of the data given some model prediction. That's basically the likelihood that I just described in the previous slide. The second term is the probability of the shear field having some form given some initial conditions, but that's the forward model. And the forward model is basically gravity and it's deterministic, so this is just a direct delta. The next term is the probability of the initial conditions given some cosmology. And that's basically the Gaussian prior for the initial conditions, which depend on the cosmological parameters through the initial matter power spectrum that determines the uh, uh, in covariance matrix of this prior. And the last term is the prior on the cosmology that are basically uniform prior. So here we want to have access to the posterior distribution. So we want samples of the posterior distribution and that will look like this. So here you see a, a movie of the different samples in a converged chain. So um, in each one of the samples, we are changing the initial conditions and the cosmological parameters. So you see in the first panel how the cosmology is changing. The second panel are the initial conditions. They look stable because this is a converged chain. And then uh, we can, of course, have access also to the, the density field and see how the different cosmology and different initial conditions affect the uh, density, uh, the, the dark matter density. So as probably you already have anticipated, sampling the initial conditions mean uh, sampling the value of the density field in each one of these voxels. And uh, that results in a very high dimensional parameter space. So in a normal analysis, we are dealing with millions of parameters. And to be able to sample in this high dimensional space, we use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo techniques to sample the density field. So basically, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, techniques allow us to uh, explore 
these parameter space efficiently by exploiting the information in the gradients and using conserved quantities that gives us uh, a high uh, acceptance rate. So we split the problem into two sampling blocks, the density field for which we use the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and a slice sampler for the rest of the parameters because we wouldn't know how to build an efficient mass matrix for the cosmological parameters or the parameters associated with the systematics. So to test the method, we uh, did an experiment with simulated data. So we used a box to generate the data that covers one gigaparsec on the sky and four gigaparsecs in the line of sight direction. So this would correspond to 16 degrees square and a resolution of 13 arc minutes. And we have lower resolution along the line of sight because the uh, lensing data is not very informative in the line of sight direction. We then have uh, four tomographic beams distributed between redshift 0.5 and 2 and uh, 30 sources per square arc minute that is what is expected for Euclid. Now to generate this data we use Lagrangian perturbation theory and we use the same model to generate the data and to analyze them. So this is a self-consistent test that will tell us what's the constraining power of the method in an idealized situation. So we analyzed these simulated data with Borg and with the power spectrum as one would do in the standard analysis and these are the results that we get. So here you see the constraints of sigma 8 and omega m that we get from analyzing the same data but just using different techniques to analyze them. So when we use the power spectrum, we get this orange contour that is this typical weak lensing banana degeneracy. And then when we analyze the same data with Borg, we get the blue contour. So Borg can leave the weak lensing degeneracy and provide more precise constraints on the cosmological parameters. In particular, in this experiment here, what we find is that the marginal errors of omega m are reduced by a factor of 5 and of sigma 8 by a factor of 3. So this is very exciting. We can get more precise constraints on the cosmology from the same data, just using different techniques to analyze them. And in addition to that, Borg also provides another data product that is very interesting uh, to do uh, science with that. So these are the density fields. So here you see the uh, convergence fields that are the density fields, the dark matter distribution projected on the sky and the initial conditions that correspond to these convergence fields. We have also projected the initial conditions on the sky because the lensing data is not very informative in the line of sight direction. So if you compare the, so the first column here is the fields that we use to generate the mock data. And then the second and third column are the mean and the standard deviation that we estimate from the posterior sample. Now if you compare the first two columns here, you see we are getting the correct structures. We also have a way to estimate the uncertainty in these maps by looking at the standard deviation and we have also checked that these uh, maps have the correct power spectrum also in 3D before we project them in, into the sky. So this is a test with simulated data but when we apply this to real observations we will get a map of the dark matter distribution that is there in the universe that we inferred from the data. And there is a lot of uh, science uh, that we can do with this kind of maps. We can, for example, use them to study galaxy or supernova environment, or we can cross-correlate them to, with the CMB to uh, try to detect SZ effect, or we can even use the initial conditions to um, run constraint simulations, and then we will have the coordinates of the objects that we see in the simulations, and we would be able to compare them directly to the objects uh, that we see on the sky. Uh, at the object level without having to do a statistical comparison. So all these are projects that have been done with work reconstructions and uh, we can do a lot of physics with these maps but they are also a very powerful test to validate our results. So we have, when we have this dark matter distribution uh, we can ask a lot of questions uh, to these maps to uh, validate our results. We can ask for example whether we get the, the clusters that we know should be there we can check whether the mass profiles of the clusters that we get agree with, uh, the, uh, with independent observations that has been done by Jens and Guillem. They measure the mass profile of the comma cluster that they get with Borg and this is consistent with measurements of the mass of comma from completely uh, independent observations. And we can also of course do the same test with the initial conditions. So uh, 
this is so I think this is very exciting. We can get more precise constraints. We can do on the cosmological parameters. We can do uh, physics with these maps, and we can also have a way to validate our results. But before we can apply this to real data, we first need control on the systematic effects. So the physics that are missing in this forward model are variant feedback and intrinsic alignments. But uh, using a field-based approach also gives us some advantage for the control of the systematic effects uh, because we can use physical models of the systematics rather than having to use the effective model one would, would need with the uh, summer statistics approach. So here we can directly implement the physics uh, that we know for these uh, systematic effects. For example, for the intrinsic alignments, we have the density field, and that means we have access to the tidal field, and we can directly implement uh, or compute the intrinsic alignments from there and implement them at the pixel level. At the moment, we already have nonlinear alignment model and the TAD model implemented in Borg. And in the very preliminary test that we are running, it looks like adding the uh, intrinsic alignments does not affect the constraining power of the method, at least at the resolution of this test. This is probably an effect of the resolution. For the variant feedback, we are using the diet all model that corrects the position of the dark matter particles. So we are also correcting variant feedback at the level of the density field rather than just correcting the power spectrum. There is also another type of systematics that is easy to implement with a field level approach, and these are all the systematics that are variable uh, the, uh, variations of the survey properties across the sky. So what you see here is a map of the uh, depth of the fit survey across the sky, and you can see that this is not homogeneous because different observing nights have different weather conditions and different seeing conditions. This is expected to affect the cosmological constraints by a, a 3% effect, and it's complicated to incorporate these effects in the power spectrum approach. But with a field level approach, it would be really easy to use these maps and to identify uh, shallower regions of the survey and account for higher uncertainty on these regions, for example, or a, or a, ri a different redshift calibration uh, on, on the different regions on the sky. So summarizing, there's a lot more information in the data than what the two-point statistics can capture. And if we want to make full use of the observations, we need methods that can access this additional information. And one way to do that is to use a field-based approach. And we have seen with Borg that we can leave the weak lens in degeneracy and get more precise constraints on the cosmological parameters. So now the next step to take with this method is to get ready for the first real data analysis. Thanks a lot.